Hey everyone, my name's Tomato Anus, also known as the greatest regret of my parents, and this is a segmented any percent speedrun of Deathloop. If you're familiar with the Tomato Anus channel, the name Seeker might ring a bell, mainly because we've collaborated with Seeker in a few videos in the past that you may have seen. Well, this video marks the return of your uncle Seeker to the channel exactly one year after our last video together. Seeker currently holds the world record for this run and performed the run you're about to see and also helped write the script to make sure the explanations are all as accurate as possible and also that I don't say anything stupid. If you'd prefer to watch either this segmented run without commentary or Seeker's current any percent world record which is also commentary free, there are links in the description. Also, with this being any percent, glitches are allowed, so if you'd prefer a run without glitches, I recommend you watch a run of the glitchless category which I've linked Creeper Hunter's record of in the description. This any percent run is performed on the officially released 1.0 patch of the game, which is a down patched version of the game, seeing as a lot of speed tech got patched out. So if you haven't played Deathloop before, um, oh boy, how do I explain this? All right. If you haven't played Deathloop before, you play as a guy named Colt who wakes up on an island named Black Reef. We're stuck in a time loop repeating the same day over and over and our goal is to take out 8 targets called visionaries across the island before midnight. The day is divided into 4 periods, morning, noon, afternoon, and evening, and the island itself is divided into 4 main areas. Each day in the game is referred to as a loop. Over the span of the game, your two main goals are to determine what the best way is to take out each visionary so that you can take them all out in one day, and then to actually take them all out in one day with the plans you develop through your investigations. This being a speedrun, we sort of skip most of the investigation part and go straight to the knocking off of the visionaries. Alright, let's get into the run. Come on, random carnival goer, one last time. Pick a hand, any hand. Alright, Shady Drifter, but this is the last time. That one. It's an ad read. Wait, no. This video is sponsored by Displate. Displates are one-of-a-kind metal posters with unique designs created by over 1.4 million artists. Displates take only 20 seconds to set up and don't require any power tools. Just put the magnet on the wall and you can hang and interchange any displate you desire. Displate is partnered with brands like Fallout, Elder Scrolls, Marvel, Star Wars, and more, so you can get displates of your favorite franchises. You can get 26% off your order if you purchase one to two displates or 36% off if you purchase three or more. Just click the link in the description and the discount is automatically applied at checkout. Shady Drifter, you cheated. There was nothing in your other hand, was there? No, there was. What was in your other hand then? Also an ad read. To start the run, we have a 51 second cutscene, so while this plays out, let's talk tech. The first glitch Seeker is going to do in the run is what we'll be referring to as Bottle Throw Cancel. Bottle Throw Cancel is a method of skipping pickup animations, dialogues, and cinematics in the game. It's performed by holding and throwing a bottle, and then pressing the use button right after to interact with something. This is going to happen first when Seeker picks up the hackamajig, and then a few other times throughout the run. The second glitch that Seeker will perform is lean clipping. In this game, you can lean side to side, and by standing next to a wall or door and holding the button to lean away from it, then spamming lean in the other direction, you're able to poke your head through the wall or door like you're nearly headless Nick. When you poke your head through a door, you can then interact with the other side of the door and open it, even if it's locked from the side you're standing on. To start the actual run, Seeker grabs a bottle real quick and begins moving and looks down while passing through a trigger to skip a coughing animation. In a moment, Seeker will bottle throw cancel while picking up the hackamajig and initiate the hacking to open a door and ram himself into the door while waiting for the hack to finish because you can't lean clip this door since there's no prompt to open it on the other side. Seeker's movement is what's called diagonal dashing, where he's able to chain together dashes as long as he moves diagonally, though some people prefer to call this crab walking. Seeker just lean clipped a door, and this isn't the direction we need to actually head right now, but there are some grenades up here that Seeker's going to use for an upcoming skip. Seeker then doubles back towards where he came from, and on the other side of the door we clip through, he does a donkey to break some boards to a tunnel. After sliding and getting a sort of slippery boost into the grotto below, Seeker continues diagonal dashing through this area, making his way to a manner to find Juliana, the main antagonist of the game. In the process, he'll hug walls in certain places and just generally have really tight movement through this rocky terrain to try and cut off as much time as possible. At the house, Seeker is going to skip a lot of dialogue and a cutscene via a skip called Library Dialogue Skip. This skip will be initiated by Seeker grabbing a bottle outside, then climbing onto some bricks on the side of the building. There he'll crouch and perform a nade boost, where he'll put down a grenade in trip mine mode directly beneath him. Seeker will then detonate the trip mine, launching him in the air, and because he's crouched when he gets launched, the game gives him a jump to use at the apex of the launch because physics. 
You're only able to perform the jump at the apex or as you're falling, so Seeker begins holding forward and spamming jump at the apex, causing Seeker to land on an invisible platform above the roof where he then kicks out a skylight to fall inside. There, Seeker will perform another bottle throw cancel while pulling the lever, which skips a cutscene where Juliana appears and confronts us. Seeker has to crouch when pulling the lever so the bottle doesn't break, since bottles are super fragile and can break even if they only fall a short way and they cause a ton of resets. To finish the library dialogue skip, Seeker will pick the bottle back up, leap on a table and mantle through some wire glass before then leaping off the building to initiate the final cutscene of this initial loop, which Seeker will skip by performing another bottle throw cancel. This finishes up the intro of the game, which speedrunners refer to as Loop Zero, and brings us to the first proper loop of the run, Loop One. We'll be keeping track of how many loops we go through in the run, so if you want to look smart, leave a guess below for how many loops we'll do, and then edit it to the correct answer when you learn the actual number, but also edit in a note saying that you got it right, so it looks like you only edited your comment to add the note about being right, and not to just change the number. To start the loop, Seeker grabbed the bottle to perform the bottle throw cancel here when grabbing the hackamajig and crouches while doing it so the bottle hopefully doesn't break. Grabbing the hackamajig this time gives us the code for the tunnel so we don't need to lean clip on the second door here anymore. When Seeker interacts with the door and grabs the slab, he performs a bottle throw cancel to skip the long animation of picking up the slab before exiting through the door which saves almost 20 seconds. Slabs are power-ups that most visionaries are equipped with and are akin to plasmids in Bioshock or abilities in Dishonored. More Dishonored than Bioshock, I guess. We're now brought to the planning stage which takes place between each period of the day, with this one being before morning. This is where you equip character trinkets, equip weapons, upgrade weapons, and all that jazz before picking where you want to go. Here Seeker does what's referred to as the menu glitch, where he spams his inputs too quickly, causing the game to softlock. Yeah, not really a useful glitch. You have to Alt F4 when this happens, but for the sake of the video, we'll skip most of the relaunching part and get back on track. Also, you may be asking at this point, if we just needed to get to the door with a slab on it to progress to the rest of the game, why couldn't we have just gone out that door at the start of the run instead of grabbing grenades and turning around? That's because we don't get the code to the tunnel doors until after we go through that intro where we meet Juliana, and if you try to exit through the slab door without knowing the tunnel codes, then the game spits you back out at the beach. This is mainly because entering the code updates our story objectives, so you can imagine trying to bypass having the code causes some issues. This being the first time we're in this menu, the game forces you to go through the tutorial of how to equip everything, so while going through it all, Seeker randomly clicks on everything until it works and hopes the menu doesn't lock up again. This time, Seeker successfully managed to equip Spring Healed, giving himself a double jump, and also added a trinket to his SMG to reduce recoil, all before heading out to Updom. So, right now, Colt has no clue what's going on since he can't metagame, but he's about to find out by reading a document called the LPP, or as some runners call it, LPP. The LPP is stored in the safe in Colt's apartment and will tell us all about how we need to take out all the visionaries in one day to break the loop, but we don't know the code to the safe since codes are randomly generated with each playthrough. Additionally, when you find the LPP for the first time, there's a minute-long cutscene that plays out that we'd ideally like to skip. Don't worry though, there is a workaround to both not knowing the code to the safe and also the cutscene, and it's called LPP Skip. Or, if you'd prefer, LPP Skip, which is the cousin to Ass from Dishonored and Bussy from Dishonored 2. So, when running through Updom, Seeker took a detour through the library to grab an enemy turret that he'll deploy next to the safe we need to get into. The placement of the turret is actually pretty exact for a reason you'll understand in a moment. After placing the turret, the next step is interacting with the LPP inside of the safe. So, the camera in Deathloop is a bit weird and not fully understood, but Seeker has a working theory for it. It's believed that the camera is attached to you at around the height of your crosshairs, so like just below head level. The camera prevents you from getting too close to things like walls, but if you look up, then the camera will be above you, and by then leaning and turning a bit to the left or right, you get a lot closer to the wall. Seeker is going to look up briefly and get himself as close as possible to the safe, then lean and look down. The act of getting the camera close to the wall by leaning while looking up, then looking down, causes shenanigans where when we look down, we aren't pushed away from the safe and we're able to see into the safe and interact with the LPP. 
Interacting with the LPP initiates the minute long cutscene I mentioned a moment ago, and normally this cutscene is us talking with another version of Colt. This is where that turret comes into play. The turret we deployed is an enemy turret, so it naturally will shoot us if we're in its sight. The other version of Colt also draws the aggro of the turret, presumably because the other Colt is a copy of our Colt called Fake Colt in the game's engine, and has the same properties as us, so it's an enemy to the turret. In order to skip the cutscene as a whole, we first need the turret to shoot Fake Colt during the first part of the dialogue after we grab the LPP, which is when our Colt is saying the line, this is how I'm going to break the loop. Unfortunately, Fake Colt doesn't spawn until the second line, when our Colt is saying, alright, 8 people, 1 day. As soon as Fake Colt does spawn though, it gets shot by the turret, interrupting the cutscene and leaving a Ghost Colt in place of Fake Colt. Ghost Colt is both invincible and invisible, but you can still assassinate it and get loot from it, it moves if you kick it, and it can even dive out of the way of grenades if you throw them next to it. Thankfully, Ghost Colt doesn't despawn, so by performing the clip to interact with the LPP again, our Colt will say, this is how I'm going to break the loop again, during which the turret continues to shoot Ghost Colt. Because Ghost Colt gets shot during that line, we're given up and down mobility with the mouse and the ability to interact with things during the cutscene. By then looking straight down, Seeker can interact with the turret to remove the battery from it, since Seeker placed the turret right at the feet of where we get relocated to at the start of the cutscene. This breaks us from the cinematic of the cutscene, allowing us to move around, but the dialogue of the cutscene keeps playing. However, all Seeker needs to do then is interact with the LPP a third time, which skips the dialogue entirely and updates the quest line for us to go to our next objective. It's a lot that all unfolds over the span of 15 seconds. I like this jacket. This is how I'm going to break the loop. All right, eight people. This is all right. I'm going to break the loop. Now that Colt knows what we have to do, Seeker can leave this area because there's nothing else beneficial to the run for us to do here right now. Throughout the run, you'll typically see Seeker kill himself three times in a row to burn through all his reprise charges and end the loop, but we're close to the exit so it's faster to just run to the tunnels instead. When Seeker arrives at the tunnels, he'll return from whence he came and be brought back to the preparation menu with the time being noon. There he's going to equip a weapon in advance time to afternoon since you're able to skip till later in the day if you'd like. The weapon that Seeker is going to equip is the Straylock Versa, which is a unique weapon you get in-game from either a visionary dropping it or completing this game's version of a quest line, but we get it in the run without doing either. Seeker gets the weapon because speedrunners of Deathloop use the Ever After Straylock Versa, which is technically DLC. The Ever After Straylock Verso is available to everyone for free by signing up to be a part of the Arcane Outsider group on Bethesda's website. It's given to you in-game pretty early on once you complete a specific quest, which Seeker technically just did, so he now has the weapon. So, in this new area, which is the complex, we're going to do some digging to advance a quest pertaining to one of the visionaries, Wenji Evans. Before we can do that, though, we have to set up another glitch referred to as the Speed Turret Glitch. After melee attacking a railing to avoid the mantle animation, Seeker will bust into one of Igor Serling's huts and pick up a field nullifier, which is like a turret but it instead makes slabs not work. Rather than pressing and releasing E to pick it up, Seeker instead continues to hold E and runs across the map to Wenji's lab, looking slightly up in the process. As long as Seeker holds E and doesn't look at any other objects that have a prompt to press E to use them, then when Seeker releases E, the nullifier will appear in his hand and will have some sort of speed boost in the back and left direction, but only when looking up or down. Seeker uses this speed to clip through the thin door here in Wenji's lab, where he then places down the nullifier and interacts with three items around the room to advance the quest far enough so that we know we have to talk to an NPC named Tubit. Seeker then places down two trip mines and detonates them to kill himself in range of the nullifier, ending the loop without having to deal with Colt respawning twice. This ends our loop and brings us to loop 2 of the run. So as Seeker just found out from the notes in Wenji's lab, Alexis Dorsey is hosting a party in the evening and Wenji doesn't want to go and we need a way to get her to go. There's only one way to do this which requires us to open a safe that we don't know the code to, so the goal of loop 2 is to find out the code to that safe. It's a relatively straightforward section of the run where Seeker is going to platform through Updom to Alexis's mansion. There he'll read a note about how there's a recording in a safe of Alexis rambling about himself, and also in the note is the code to the safe, which is the code we're coming here for. Here Seeker sleekly chains a slide into a double jump to avoid some trip mines. 
Seeker will pass through some spotlight laser sensors in a second that when tripped close a door we need to go through, but Seeker is dashing and moving in a specific way that let him get through the door before it closed. After Seeker runs through the town square here, he'll be arriving at the party and you'll be able to tell they really went with the lowest bidder when it came to hiring security for the party. After crab walking past the bouncer, Seeker dashes through a courtyard of the mansion and climbs on a structure to be able to jump to the roof. From the roof, Seeker will leap through an open window and be in Alexis's room where he'll find the note we need that has the code to the safe. Now that Seeker has what he came for, he's going to run into a nearby room, throw down a field nullifier to nullify the reprise slab, and shoot a toxic gas explosive to kill himself and end our loop, bringing us to loop 3. We're still in the information collecting stage of the run, if you will, because the main goal of this loop is to get another code. This is the last code that we need to get in order to beat the run, though. One of the visionaries, Igor Serling, dedicates his whole day to running experiments in the name of science. He also likes to be liked and invited to things, like Alexis's party. It turns out that if we sabotage Igor's experiment early enough in the day, then all his science will be ruined and he'll go to Alexis's party for sad boy hours. Getting the code to ruin Igor's experiment is about as straightforward as getting the code in the previous loop, with Seeker running across the complex here, taking some intentional damage, and picking up a field nullifier along the way. When Seeker goes outside right here, he's going to be in an open snowy area where he'll punch the air, diagonal dashing across to a bunker that he's going to cut through. At the bunker, Seeker leaps through a wooden barrier and moves carefully to avoid the mines. They can give a boost if you hit them right, but they can also slow you down by killing your momentum or pushing you in an undesirable direction. When Seeker arrives at one of Igor's science huts, he'll throw down the nullifier before shooting out the window and hopping in the hut to read a note on the whiteboard and get the code. Because of the intentional damage Seeker took earlier, he only needs to put down one proximity charge to kill himself and reset the loop, bringing us to loop 4. Loop 4 is the penultimate loop, meaning that the fifth loop is the final one, so now is the time to scroll down and click edit on your comment and change the number and also add a note saying you were right so it doesn't look like you just edited the number. I'm also tasking you now with finding another comment that clearly did the same thing and congratulating them on getting the number of loops correct. So, now we're headed back to Updom, doing our final bit of preparation for the run before we attempt the final loop where we take out all the visionaries. We have the code to sabotage Igor's experiment, which will lure him to Alexis's party, and all we have to do now is set up our bait for luring Wenji to the party. This is where that safe code we got from Alexis's party comes into play, because here Seeker goes to the library and opens the safe in the middle of the room to get a little statue of Alexis called the Runt. The Runt plays a recording of Alexis on loop, and we're going to use the NPC named 2-Bit that we learned about earlier to doctor the audio to make a message of our choosing. The safe the Runt is in actually needs to be open for a couple seconds before you can grab the Runt, which is why Seeker can't just lean clip in to grab it like he did earlier with the LPP. Once Seeker arrives at 2-Bit's location, he hacks his way inside with the hackamajig, puts down the runt, and lays down some mines for later. Entering a trigger in the room gets 2-Bit talking, and boy, is there a lot of talking to get through. Luckily, we're able to run around the level while this dialogue plays out. Seeker takes advantage of the time he has to kill here by first laying down mines to kill himself later, then running outside and pulling a Denethor twice to burn both reprise charges so that when the mines kill him later, his loop is ended. When Seeker returns to 2-Bit, he'll give him the runt, which for story reasons will bait Wenji into coming to Alexis's party. While this all plays out, I'd just like to say I hope you're all doing well. I know not all of us are so lucky to be in a good place right now though, so I'd like to repeat, as always, that no feeling is final. I say this every video, so for a lot of people it's turned into a meme by now, but it bears repeating. There are happy days ahead, and no matter how bad things may seem at the moment, those feelings don't define you or the rest of your life. Feelings of dread or despair are temporary, and while they may shadow over everything going on right now, I can assure you that there will come a time in the future where they won't. It may be hard at the moment right now, but you are stronger than you think you are. Be sure to recognize that and give yourself credit for getting through rough mental health periods, rather than giving credit to the media you consume. You're the ones getting through any adversity. It's your strength and yourself that's doing the work. Back to the run, once the dialogue with 2-Bit wraps up, Seeker detonates the mines to end his loop. This brings us to the final loop, Loop 5, or as runners call it, the Death Loop. Get it? It's the name of the game. 
This time we won't die though, hopefully. It's worth stating that from this point on, it's not really possible to explain what's going on without spoiling the results of a few quest lines. Seeker and I tried to be as spoiler free as we could up to this point with what's going on, but it's around now that we'll have to break the facade and start divulging more info for how the final plan plays out. If you don't want any major gameplay spoilers or minor story spoilers, now would be the time to tune out. There will be a cutscene later on where we recap the full plot of the game, which will include major story spoilers, but you'll be warned when that happens, so no worries if those are specifically what you want to avoid. In the first area of the final loop, we'll be taking out one visionary indirectly and another directly. In the evening of every loop, the visionary named Ramblin' Frank Spicer puts on a fireworks show, and the fireworks are all stored in a shed here. Normally, you have to find a code to unlock the shed, where you can then sabotage the fireworks to kill Frank, but in the run, Seeker is able to just do a lean clip to peek his head through and interact with the fireworks to jam the rain flaps so they explode on Frank, meaning Frank will now be a dead man walking. What is this? Seeker then climbs up the neighboring building and shoots through a hole in the ceiling to alert everyone inside, including visionary Harriet Morse. This causes Harriet to flee to a different part of the building where Seeker is able to get some pop shots in on her, officially taking out our first visionary of the run. Seeker leaps off the roof and double jumps just before landing to reset his momentum and avoid fall damage, then runs to the exit. Because this is the first time we've killed a visionary in this playthrough, that means we'll be getting a cutscene when we exit the area. Thankfully, there's a skip to this cutscene, where when Seeker presses F to interact with the door, he'll then press Enter to confirm leaving, and then spam pressing both F and Enter together. This skips the cutscene by interrupting Colt's dialogue line that plays when you interact with the door. It's at this point that it's probably worth mentioning that Seeker does this run in online mode, meaning that he can technically be invaded by other players trying to kill him, although technically he can't be invaded. The way Seeker got the LPP earlier skips an encounter with Juliana at night in Updom where we open the safe and she already took the LPP, which is then immediately followed by a scripted invasion from her. Seeker believes that the first scripted encounter is what flips the switch to make it so you can be invaded regularly, so because Seeker skipped the encounter via LPP skip, we get no encounters. Playing in online mode has the benefit of Seeker being able to check codes during dialogues at the start of the level without losing any time since if you're playing in single player mode, the game pauses when you press escape. That comes in handy here, where after loading in and as Colt and Juliana talk, Seeker pulls up the note he grabbed at Igor's earlier to see what code he'll need to manually enter, which in this run ended up being C704. Additionally, like I said earlier, Igor dedicates his whole day to running experiments in the name of science, but by sabotaging his experiment, he'll go to Alexis's party in the evening. The thing is though, Igor's experiment is invisible. This is because Igor used the powers of his Aether Slab, which turns the user invisible, to also turn the experiment doodad invisible. To get it to turn uninvisible, or I guess as the layman would call it, visible, Seeker needs to throw down a field nullifier near it. After grabbing the nullifier from one of Igor's science huts and throwing it down by the doodad, Seeker will then wait until the doodad becomes interactable before punching in the code C704, pressing the red button and piecing out to the tunnels. We're now about halfway through the day with only one of our visionaries actually being dead, but don't worry, the last two periods of the day are a bloodbath. For the afternoon period of the day, we're going to go to Freestad Rock for the first time in the run, because at this time of day, two of the visionaries hook up in a bunker there. Normally, finding and gaining access to the bunker calls for a fair bit of exploring and questing, but in the speedrun we have a fancy way around all that. Rather than finding the code to enter, Seeker is going to go to the room where we input the code and clip out of bounds, then navigate the bunker while out of bounds. First though, we have to get to the bunker. Getting there is pretty straightforward, aside from shortly after loading in when Seeker climbs up a ledge, looks down, and attacks the ground with his machete to cancel the climbing animation early. Like I said though, it's pretty straightforward, so I'll give you all a brief reprieve from my nasally accent. Do you really think you'd survive against all of us at the same time? Maybe not. But I bet I got real close. Sorry the reprieve wasn't longer. Back to commentary. Seeker is now approaching the bunker where Charlie Montague and Fia Sparovska fill cream donuts. Here, Seeker will jump up onto the middle of a light fixture that's hanging from the ceiling and put a mine down below him. Seeker will then chop it with his machete, detonating the mine and launching Seeker through the ceiling, putting him out of bounds on top of the ceiling. Here, Seeker drops down to the lower level, places another mine, and explodes it to clip himself back in bounds. Seeker then spams both aim and fire so that his aim is repeatedly snapping onto Charlie and Fia with aim assist, making for a pseudo aimbot. 
With both of them taken out, Seeker grabbed the shift slab from Charlie, which is essentially Blink from Dishonored, and kills himself twice to quickly spawn himself back outside. It's worth noting that killing Fia via gunfire is actually not required as long as you alert her while killing Charlie. Alerting her causes the water level in the room to rise, which will eventually kill her, so as long as we kill Charlie and get the shift slab and also alert Fia, you're all clear for that part. With Charlie and Fia gone, we're down to five remaining visionaries, one of whom's death is already aligned thanks to our fireworks tinkering. Also, using the shift slab is a pretty fast way to move around, so Seeker incorporates it into his movement alongside diagonal dashing from here on out. So, we're now entering the evening portion of the death loop, and like I just said, there are five remaining visionaries. Frank will die off screen, but Seeker is going to be going through the next level so quickly that it'll happen just under the wire with Frank dying as we'll be entering a cutscene. That leaves four visionaries, but this section we're entering has only three visionaries available for us to kill, Alexis Dorsey, Wenji Evans, and Igor Serling. That leaves Juliana for us to kill after those three, but let's not get ahead of ourselves, we'll get to her when we get to her. So, the first visionary we'll be killing here is Alexis, the one hosting the party tonight. Alexis and everyone else at the party are wearing wolf masks, excluding Wenji and Igor. Normally, you're supposed to do some digging throughout Alexis's mansion to find ways to get him to reveal himself amongst the crowd. Alexis always spawns in one of two locations though, so Seeker knows exactly where to look for him, and in this run, Alexis spawned at the faster of the two locations, letting Seeker just drop a body to the floor in the middle of the party. Seeker then climbs up on the building to get to a vantage point overlooking the rooftop area that Wenji and Igor are at, and again, it spams both aim and shoot to have a pseudo aimbot while killing them. With those two taken out, we now have seven of the eight visionaries accounted for, leaving just Juliana. To get to Juliana, we're going to need to do a glitch called a blink clip. Blink clips are pretty straightforward, but require certain positioning and don't work everywhere. Seeker is going to perform two blink clips coming up, the first on a door. Seeker will wedge himself into the corner of the door and aim his shift ability into the corner until the visual indicator for the ability disappears. Seeker will then dash and instantly let go of the shift ability, which will cause him to shift out of bounds. He'll then hit the button above him with his machete to open the door and shift again to get back in bounds where he'll do another blink clip while standing on a table. After putting himself in the corner on the table, Seeker will again get his shift ability all ready to go, dash backwards, and immediately let go of shift, which causes him to clip into the room behind him. Pretty straightforward stuff. That covers all the glitch explanations for this run, so let's get into major story spoilers. If you don't want to hear any of the spoilers, just mute the video until the dancing dog goes away. Final warning, three, two, one, Colt is actually Santa and he's in a coma imagining this all. Nah, just kidding. Just wanted to give some more buffer room to mute. Time for the actual story. So Colt was part of the military expedition that discovered this island decades ago, but was accidentally sent into the future when an experiment went wrong. In the future, Colt then joined what's called the Eon Program, which is a group consisting of the other visionaries. Colt's goal was to find a way to travel back to the past to reunite with his girlfriend, Lila. It turns out, though, that Juliana is Colt and Lila's daughter. Colt eventually began to have second thoughts about the Eon program and sought out murdering all the visionaries to free Juliana from the loop, much to her dismay. This is what led to her trying to kill us every loop. We're now on our way to confront Juliana about this all in what's called the Rocchetto Plan, which is an old rocket plane left behind by the military. Juliana is hiding out in the loop, which is the big circular structure on the island and is what actually powers the island's time loops. When we arrive, Seeker is going to set out to end the game in the fastest way there is, killing Juliana and then killing himself, because Colt is actually the ninth visionary. This leaves every visionary dead and breaks the loop. Hi, welcome back, spoiler avoiders. So, when Seeker gains control, he's going to make quick work of the linear pathing here to get to our final confrontation. Normally, you open a door and talk to Juliana before making any final decisions, but Seeker is instead going to run himself into a wall to position himself correctly, crouch, and shoot Juliana through a small crack in the doorway. Seeker then immediately follows this up by wedging himself in the corner of the doorway, queuing up shift, and performing a blink clip to go through the door and fall off the walkway, killing himself and ending the game. If you've made it to the end of this video, on behalf of both myself and Seeker, thank you so much. 
This run is a blast due to the nature of the game, and I'm grateful that we were able to show it to you on this channel so soon after release. Getting this video to you all so quickly would not have been possible without Seeker, who is one of my favorite people in speedrunning. I actually didn't intend to make this video for a bit, but shot Seeker a message on a whim to see if he had any availability to collaborate in the coming months, and he replied with let's go. Pretty much we went from this video being a few months out to the script being underway over the span of 5 minutes. Seeker is an incredibly talented speedrunner, so please do check out his socials, links are in the description. Also, thank you so much to everyone who supports the channel on Patreon. This video would not have been possible without you all. Supporting the channel monetarily is entirely unnecessary, but you choose to do it anyway. If you'd like to support the channel monetarily as well, and also get early access to videos and access to versions without sponsor reads, you get both of those by contributing literally $1 a month to the Patreon. For $1, you also get updates on videos as they're being made, and get to participate in polls to decide runs covered in future Speedrun Explained videos whenever we cross a significant patron milestone. But again, it's entirely unnecessary. And lastly, as always, check out the Tomato Anus Discord server. The people there are so friendly and supportive of each other, it's a great place to hang out. Despite being a server centered around a speedrunning channel, the server is really just a lot of people talking to each other and seeing how their days have been going and what they've been up to. Stop on by to join one of the more wholesome groups I've encountered online and join the fun. That's all for this video though. This was an any% speedrun of Deathloop, I've been Tomato Anus, and I hope you have an above average day.